In this lecture, we turn our attention to a sometimes overlooked aspect or a couple of aspects related to uh, serious life-threatening and chronic illnesses. And that is the issue of caregivers, uh, typically loved ones who provide care for individuals suffering with chronic or life-threatening illnesses and the important um, uh, issues that they face as well as the issue of survivorship, uh, psychological and health challenges faced by individuals who are survivors post-treatment of life-threatening conditions. One of the things that's important to remember is that almost anybody can become a caregiver. Probably when you think of a caregiver, you think of uh, perhaps an older individual, uh, maybe near retirement age, caring for somebody in later life who is in failing health. But in reality, almost anyone can become a caregiver for a loved one at almost any age uh, because of the prevalence of life-threatening and chronic conditions um, and the variety of family situations and structures. Um, almost anyone, um, a child for a parent, a parent for a child, a child for a grandparent, or vice versa. So there's a lot of different ways people can become caregivers. In any given year, nearly 30% or about one in three of the entire U.S. population is in a role as caregiver. That's an astonishing statistic to me and maybe uh, to you as well. Uh, depending on the illness and the nature of the illness, the course of the illness, uh, this new role can develop slowly or be sudden. Uh, so, for example, if somebody um, is diagnosed with a newly diagnosed cancer that came upon suddenly and is in an advanced stage, somebody can almost immediately overnight become a caregiver. Uh, perhaps somebody is a caregiver for somebody who was in an accident. Um, and that can literally be an overnight transition uh, of a new role that can develop. There's other kinds of conditions, uh, for example, dementia and Alzheimer's, where the new role can develop very slowly over time because of the nature of the illness. There's a number of degenerative physical illnesses, uh, things like ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, which begin with very small, subtle, almost unseen symptoms and then develop very slowly over time, leading to uh, disability. We do know that uh, caregiver is not equally distributed across uh, gender. Uh, approximately three in four uh, primary caregivers are women. So this is, uh, some people frame this as largely a uh, women's issue um, in terms of its impact on our population. And, and there's some uh, good reason behind that. Caregivers for years were sort of unseen, untalked about, just not really the issue. The focus was on the patient, the focus was on the individual with the illness or condition, and um, the illness was certainly on trying to help people survive. We've only recently, maybe in the last generation or so, the last 20 to 30 years, realized uh, what a critical part caregivers play in the overall team of people providing care for an individual, and also the special needs of caregivers and the, the burdens and the impacts upon both the psychological and physical health of caregivers. Caregiving is, of course, a very demanding and stressful job. Um, it's complicated. It has lots of responsibilities. Individuals in the role of caregivers often are a health care assistant. They are a care coordinator. They're the ones who are making the appointments, providing the transportation, um, interpreting doctors' uh, information from physicians, and ensuring compliance with uh, medical regimens. They're also a health care advocate, a decision maker, uh, depending on the nature of the illness and the disability of the individual receiving care. Um, the individual in the caregiver role may be faced with critical uh, uh, life-altering decisions about uh, health and health care that can be incredibly stressful. Um, interestingly, these decisions many of us would find quite easier for ourselves but quite difficult when they involve um, another person. Of course, uh, finances and money are a huge issue with people with chronic conditions and often the caregiver finds himself in the role of financial manager. Uh, sometimes folks find themselves in this role with no life experience to prepare them for it. Uh, so perhaps uh, one um, uh, partner in a couple was not ever involved in the finances. The other partner was the one who paid all the bills, who watched the checking account. That's not uncommon in many um, uh, relationships. Well, if the one who was the, the person who managed the money gets sick and the other person becomes the caregiver, um, that's a whole new and important role that somebody may feel completely unprepared for.
Caregivers are often the family coordinator. They're the ones who communicate. They're the ones who send all the updates and Facebook messages and manage travel and visits to people, and that can be a, another burden. Often they become a legal advocate or a legal counsel, uh, particularly if it's a life-threatening or chronic condition that is likely to um, uh, end in death. Um, there's a lot of issues related to that in terms of getting one's affairs in order, getting all the paperwork in place, and dealing with lawyers and legal issues. And lastly, of course, and after all of that, this other stuff could almost be forgotten, that their primary role could be, probably should be, that they are a loving companion and a support to that individual. That can kind of almost get lost behind all of these other heavy, time-demanding responsibilities, but the most important role caregivers play is uh, providing that love, support, and companionship um, for their loved one. We know that caregiving is a significant stressor. It causes a lot of stress. There's a lot of research on this. Uh, one of the articles uh, you will read highlights the uh, stress that parents feel as caregivers for children with chronic conditions, and so that's an important article to pay attention to. Uh, caregivers are often very vulnerable. They're financially vulnerable. They may be at risk of losing life savings, of uh, facing bankruptcy, of, of uh, putting themselves in a lot of financial risk due to the costs associated with care. They're also, of course, emotionally and psychologically vulnerable because of the, uh, the stress, the, the, um, all of it that goes into psychologically caring for someone and watching somebody you care and love deeply about. Uh, going through something very difficult. Um, and of course they can be physically vulnerable as well because often one of the things we know is that caregivers may neglect their own health in favor of supporting the health of their loved one and put themselves at risk there as well, not to mention the physical impact and toll of the stress and emotional impacts. Uh, families with caregivers are two and a half times more likely to live in poverty and five times more likely to receive welfare. We mentioned they're financially vulnerable. Often these individuals find themselves um, in a caregiver role when they were already in a financially vulnerable state, perhaps living paycheck to paycheck, barely getting by, depending on the income of a loved one, and that income may be lost due to illness or disability and puts these families into somewhat desperate financial situations. Uh, about half of working caregivers use up most or all of their savings on caregiving expenses. Wow, what a burden uh, caregiving is. We know that many people who are caregivers have symptoms of depression. Uh, anywhere from nearly half to maybe as much as three in four have symptoms of depression. And about one in four meet criteria for clinical depression. Um, so serious psychological impacts. We also know that nearly 25% of caregivers are in poor health themselves and have high rates of health risk behaviors. They don't eat well. They tend to be relatively physically inactive. Uh, they may abuse substances to try to cope with the stress. Um, so lots of uh, challenges and burdens on caregivers. Uh, partly because of the increased attention of the role and burden of caregiving, uh, there's been a lot more emphasis on support over the last 20 years or so. Uh, we know that caregivers need support. They need support from the health professionals, they need support from family and from peers, and at minimum they need somebody to recognize the incredible burden that they carry. Uh, there are some organizations like the National Family Caregivers Association and the National Alliance for Caregiving um, that, have a, that have this public outreach campaign called Family Caregiving 101 that's meant to provide uh, support information as well as some networking uh, to help prop up and, and help out people who are in a caregiving role. They recommend that there are four essential strategies for any caregiver. First, believe in yourself. Second, protect yourself. Take care of yourself. Third, reach out for help when you need it, uh, seeking both voluntary supports as well as paid supports when they're available. And lastly, they say to stand up for yourself. Don't forget that while you're so busy advocating for the person who is receiving your care, don't forget to advocate for yourself and the things that you need um, uh, to be well as well. Uh, I recommend you visit that web page and just poke around a little bit to uh, learn more about some of the uh, things that they recommend for people who are in a caregiving role. And if you know people who are in that role, perhaps share that information with them. Uh, the other issue we're going to turn to briefly is this issue of survivorship. 
One of the things that we've seen over the last 50 years is tremendous advances in treatment success for many life-threatening illnesses, many illnesses which were almost certain to be uh, a death sentence, to lead to death in a fairly short period of time. Many people now survive. We saw data uh, last week on cancer uh, in that regard. Because of that, there's a new need to focus on a whole new issue, and that is survivorship. What about life after successful treatment? And it turns out um, that after successful treatment for life-threatening illnesses, um, life doesn't really return to normal. Um, the term you often hear in survivorship uh, literature is it's a new normal. Um, things have changed. You don't just simply, typically people don't simply just go back to their roles, their jobs, their life the way it was. There are typically some changes to be adapted to after treatment. As I mentioned, we've seen tremendous success in treating things. Uh, one example of this, uh, here's another astonishing number, I think. Um, approximately 10 million Americans uh, in our population alive today are cancer survivors, meaning their treatment has concluded, their cancer is in remission or no longer detectable, and they are in that survivorship uh, stage of their uh, cancer experience. Survivorship brings with it lots of challenges. Uh, many survivors fear recurrence because that is a likelihood with most of these life-threatening conditions. They have to watch out for that. Some may have guilt over surviving when others may have not. Uh, many people dealing with life-threatening conditions in the medical setting uh, become close with other people, their peers, who are also struggling um, with an illness. And some of those individuals uh, will not survive that illness. And for those who do, there can be a sense of guilt of, you know, why did, I, why did I survive when somebody else perhaps I perceive as equally or even more deserving uh, did not. Individuals in survivorship may be dealing with new disabilities or limitations on their life. As a result of that, there may be a relationship and role changes. So they may no longer be the primary breadwinner. They may no longer be somebody who provides financial income in the home. They may not be somebody who can provide um, uh, shared parenting or other responsibilities in the home. And those can be uh, challenges into survivorship. Um, people rarely return to the old normal. They adapt to a new normal. And uh, there's also ongoing demands for monitoring or aftercare. Uh, many uh, conditions will have lots of recommendations for one's self for monitoring for symptoms, for watching for signs of recurrence, for complying with some aspects of aftercare, including follow-up visits to a doctor, and those create a whole other uh, a set of challenges themselves. Uh, this list is not meant to be exhaustive. It's only a partial list of some of the examples of things that people face in survivorship. One of the articles you'll read this week is uh, some excerpts from an Institute of Medicine report on survivorship. And this is a figure from that report that points out that in cancer survivorship, uh, there's a lot of issues to address here, at least in four big domains. Uh, the big domains that they point out as needing to be addressed or need some attention in the survivorship phase are first the physical well-being and the symptoms, so taking care of oneself, engaging in wellness behaviors, um, uh, watching out for uh, signs of recurrence, uh, dealing with uh, sometimes uh, transformative issues like infertility or lack of ability to engage in intimacy. Uh, they also mention psychological well-being, so dealing with fears and anxiety, coping with depression, um, sometimes that involves things like post-traumatic growth and some positive psychological consequences as we talked about a few lectures ago. There's also the social well-being to pay attention to, one's role in social relationships, um, in the family, in other kind of social networks, um, uh, work in the workplace are other kinds of issues. And the fourth big domain is spiritual well-being, individuals trying to come to terms with their spirituality, with the meaning of the illness, what does it mean for their understanding of a relationship with um, um, uh, their uh, God or the spiritual aspects of themselves, uh, trying to figure out what all this means. Um, often for people who are facing a life-threatening illness, while that is certainly um, a prominent issue after diagnosis, it often kind of gets pushed behind a little bit um, during the phase where an individual is actively in treatment and just simply trying to survive because there isn't the time or energy to deal with that. And sometimes it's not until survivorship that those issues, those struggles over uh, what does this mean and what does it mean for my spirituality or my faith uh, really surface 
in the survivorship phase when there's kind of time to catch a breath and, and reflect on it to some degree. Uh, so I recommend that you um, uh, have a look at those articles from the Institute of Medicine. They really do a nice job of capturing um, and summarizing some of these issues. So that completes our uh, brief lecture on issues related to caregiving and survivorship.